Up first is R. Sharma, member of technical staff from VMware, talking about the importance of tracking dependencies in a large project like Kubernetes and about DepStep, which is a tool created to track dependency updates to the Kubernetes code base. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cloud Native Rejects. I am Arsh, and I work at VMware. I'm also on the current Kubernetes release team. This session is going to be about how we use a tool called DepStack to evaluate dependency updates in the upstream Kubernetes project. So let's get started. Before we begin, I want to give a brief overview of what I'll be covering in the talk. I want to keep this session very beginner friendly. So without assuming any prior knowledge, we'll start by a brief intro to what dependencies even are, how Go handles them, and why you should even care about your project dependencies in the first place. Then I'll introduce you to DepStack, which is the command line tool we use in the upstream project to analyze dependencies. I'll first show you all the subcommands it offers, and then we'll look at how exactly we use it for the Kubernetes project. In the end, I'll touch on how I got the opportunity to work on this project. And I'll also go over some of the mentorship opportunities available if you too are looking to contribute to Kubernetes. So first things first, what exactly are dependencies? Dependencies put simply are external packages which your code uses. These external packages are distributed as modules. As per the definition of a module in Go, it is nothing but a directory containing a collection of nested and related Go packages with a go.mod file at its root. If you aren't familiar with what a go.mod file is, don't worry, I'll be covering that in the next few slides. For example, here, if you take a look at this uh, screenshot, you'll see that to make HTTP requests in our code, we're using this very common module called Julian Schmidt HTTP router, which then ends up being a dependency of our project. If you look closely, there are other packages and modules that we are importing too, but they are internal to Go, so we don't consider them as dependencies of our project. By default, if you create a main.go file and start writing code in it, you won't get the support of Go's dependency management tools. You will need to put your code in its own module in order to track and manage the dependencies you add. And you can do this by running the go mod init command. A fun fact is that now since your code is present in its own module, if you upload it to somewhere like GitHub, others can import it and then they would have a dependency on your module in their project. Once you put your code in its own module, you'll see that a go.mod file appears in your project directory. A go.mod file describes the module's properties, including its dependencies on other modules and on versions of code. You can see a simple go.mod file on the left side. Uh, when you add dependencies, Go tools also create a go.sum file that contains the checksums of the modules you depend on. Go uses this to verify the integrity of the downloaded module files. Please note that the go.sum file is auto-generated based on your go.mod file, and you should never need to edit it manually. To keep your managed dependency set tidy, you can use the go mod tidy command. Using the set of packages imported in your code, this command edits your go.mod file to add modules that are necessary but missing. It also removes unused modules that do not provide any relevant packages. So for example, if you stop using the packages provided by example.com slash this module, when you run go go mod tidy, it will remove uh, example.com slash this module from your go mod file. And lastly, go, go mod tidy will also regenerate the go.sum file based on your updated go mod file. So now that you know what dependencies are and go handles them, let's talk a bit about why you should even care about managing and keeping a track of your dependencies. Well, the thing is that sooner or later, you would have to update the dependencies of your project. This might be because you want to want the changes in the latest release of that dependency. But let's say 
even if you're satisfied with the current features, you might have to update the dependencies because of a security vulnerability found in the older release, which got fixed in the newer one. And updating your dependencies brings with it a whole new set of headaches. You will have to make sure that it doesn't break the current code and that it is compatible with the existing versions of other dependencies that you are using. So I think when it comes to dependencies, it is safe to say the lesser, the better. Now, this does not mean that you should, you know, go and try implementing the functionality of each external package on your own. No, the reason I say that is because lesser dependencies mean you will have to keep track of fewer releases for your project dependencies, and you would have a much easier time updating those dependencies. Now, uh, I can totally get it if all of this may seem trivial for a small project. And to be very honest, you could get away with not caring about dependencies at all. But when a project grows to the size of Kubernetes, all of this becomes very important. Updating dependencies could often mean breaking stuff. Skipping a crucial dependency update could mean exposing a lot of users to a security risk. So long story short, the simpler the dependency chains are, the better. Being particular about your project dependencies right from the start and tracking them is extremely helpful in the long run. It was to solve these very problems in the upstream Kubernetes project that we created Debstat. Before we see what Debstat does, let me go over what we wanted out of this tool. So we knew that we needed something to analyze dependencies, but what should this thing do? The biggest problem we wanted to solve was that with the Kubernetes repository receiving so many pull requests, it was getting tough to notice which of these were changing dependencies. Not only that, but more importantly, how were these PRs changing the dependencies? What was the impact of these changes? We also wanted there to be a way using which PR authors can themselves see the impact of dependency changes they are making without them having to rely on one of the maintainers. And it is to solve all these problems that we came up with Debstat. So Debstat is a command line tool for analyzing dependencies of Go modules enabled projects. You can install it by running go install github.com slash Kubernetes 6 slash Debstat and getting the latest release. Or you could also grab the latest binary from the Debstat repository. It provides us with four subcommands, each of which we'll now be looking at in detail in the following slides. The first and most important thing from the point of view of upstream Kubernetes Stepstat provides us with is the stats subcommand. Running Debstat stats in your project directory would give you an output which should look something like this. It would show you the number of direct dependencies transitive dependencies, total dependencies, and the max depth of dependencies. Let us now go over what each of these means. Direct dependencies, as the name suggests, are dependencies which are used by us in our project directly. What does using directly mean? Well, if we go back to the previous code, we see here that we import Julian Schmidt HTTP router, and then in the first line under the main function, we use it. Now. Let's say if this module internally uses some other module to do what it does, we don't care about that, even though that is technically essential for our code to work properly. So in this case, Julian Schmidt HTTP router would be a direct dependency of our project. And whatever external module, if any, Julian Schmidt HTTP router is using internally to do what it does, that would end up being a transitive dependency of our project. So it means that transitive dependencies are nothing but dependencies which are further needed by the direct dependencies of our module. Another fun way to put it is that they are basically the direct dependencies of the direct dependencies of our module. The next thing the output uh, shows us is the total number of dependencies of our project, which is pretty self-explanatory apart from one slight caveat. Uh, even though here in this example, you see that the sum of the direct and the transitive dependencies is equal to the total dependencies, it doesn't necessarily have to be so. Why is that? 
simply because a dependency can be both a direct dependency as well as a transitive dependency. This is best explained with the following example. Let us say that our module depends on this module called Woof, which internally uses this other module called Meow. But our module also directly uses Meow. So in this case, Meow is both a direct dependency as well as a transitive dependency. So if you see in this example, the number of direct dependencies is two, Woof and Meow. The number of transitive dependencies is one, just Meow. But the total number of dependencies is not two plus one. Rather, it is just two, which is Woof and Meow. This is the reason that it is not always necessary for the total dependencies to be equal to the sum of direct and transitive dependencies. The final thing in the output is the max depth of dependencies, which is nothing but the length of the longest dependency chain. Going back to the previous slide, we see that there are two dependency chains here. One is from our module to Woof to Meow, which has a length of three, and the other is from our module to Meow, which has a length of two. So uh, the max depth of dependencies in this case would be equal to three. You can also uh, run the stats subcommand with the verbose mode on to see the actual chain whose length is being showed in the max depth of dependencies. Going over to the next subcommand devstat provides us, it is the graph subcommand. This generates a graph.dot file, which can be used with graphviz.dot command to visualize the dependencies of a project. Graphviz, for those of you who are not familiar, is another command line tool which provides a way of representing structural information as diagrams of graphs. So if you look here, you can run the devstat graph command and it will inform you that it has created a graph.dot file. It is this file that GraphWiz will use to generate the actual graph. Running the GraphWiz command to generate the graph, you would see that a dag.svg file appears in your project directory. If you open this file, you should see a graph which would look something like this. Highlighted in yellow will be your main project module, and from that you can visualize the direct dependencies, and from those you will see the transitive dependencies originating further. Now, this graph is produced by a simple Go modules project I had created for this talk. But I also want to show you the beauty which gets generated when we create a graph out of all the dependencies of the Kubernetes repository. Beautiful, isn't it? Well, this should give you an idea of how complex dependency chains can get in a project as large as Kubernetes and why we needed a way to analyze these dependencies. The graph subcommand also comes with a useful flag which lets you specify a particular dependency whose chains you want to be highlighted. Let's say you only wanted to see the chains which have github.com slash kr slash text in them. Then you can run the command shown and you would see an output similar to what you see right now. Going over to the third subcommand that Debstat provides us is the cycles subcommand. What this does is show all the cycles present in the dependencies of the project. An example of a cycle in the project dependencies is if A depends on B, which depends on C, which further again depends on A. So here for the simple project I've been using till now, you'll see that the cycles in the dependencies are due to Xnet depending on X crypto and vice versa. For Kubernetes though, no surprise, there are many more cycles which are much more complicated. And what you see on your screen right now isn't even the complete output of the command. The final subcommand devstat provides us with is a very simple one, which is devstat list. All this does is simply print a sorted list of all the project dependencies. So, now that you know what Depstat is, let me go over how we use it in the upstream Kubernetes project. Depstat runs as part of two prow jobs for the Kubernetes repository. What is prow, you might ask? Prow is a Kubernetes-based CI-CD system. 
Plow jobs can be triggered by various types of events and report their status to many different services. To put it in very simple terms and in the context of this talk, Prow is basically responsible for running certain tests on PRs that are made. It, also run, it can also run these tests on the master branch of a repository. For Debstat, we have two Prow jobs. One is a periodic job which runs once every six hours on the master branch of the KK repository. KK, for those of you who are not familiar, stands for Kubernetes slash Kubernetes and refers to the code present in the Kubernetes repository. Uh, so this job would produce an output which would look something like this once every six hours. The, we also have a pre-submit prow job which runs automatically on pull requests which change the go.mod file, go.sum file, or any other files in the vendor directory. The vendor directory is where the stuff related to dependencies is present in the Kubernetes repository. This can also be manually triggered on pull requests by commenting slash test check dependency stats. And all of this is thanks to Prow. What this job does is then run Debstat on the code which is present in the pull request and print it and print its difference with the output of running Debstat on the master branch of the Kubernetes repository. This way we get to know what will change in terms of dependencies for Kubernetes if we merge that particular pull request. So if your pull request changes dependencies, Prow would catch that and run the check dependency stats job, which would give an output similar to the one you see on right. Here for this PR, the number of direct dependencies were being changed by one, which is what Debstat reported. Here is a, another example of a PR where a total of 16 dependencies were removed, which is a huge number and goes a long way in improving the dependency chains of Kubernetes. Finally, towards the end of this talk, I want to touch a bit upon how I got the opportunity to work on this project and how you too can get started with the help of various mentorship opportunities the Kubernetes community provides. I applied to this program called the Linux Foundation Mentorship Program. Luckily, I got selected and got this opportunity to be mentored by Dems, who most people who have been involved in the Kubernetes community would know. Going from almost no prior knowledge of Kubernetes or Go, I learned a lot from him while working on this project. This is why I would highly encourage everyone, regardless of their existing knowledge, to apply to these mentorship opportunities if you're looking to get started contributing to open source projects like Kubernetes. My only request is that please do not self-reject when applying to these mentorships, thinking that you do not know enough. As Tim's perfectly put it, we are all learning all the time. So please do not hesitate asking questions or applying. The final thing I want to go over is a few other programs which you can apply to. A very, mis a very common misconception with these programs is that they are only for university students. That is not true. The Linux Foundation program runs three times a year and is open to everyone. Similarly, for each Kubernetes release, there is a release team and you can apply to be on the release team where a release role lead would mentor four or five shadows under them. This, there is an, this, this is another excellent opportunity to run, learn the ropes of the Kubernetes project. There is also the Google Summer of Code program, which runs once a year and is only for students. Personally, I've been a part of all three of these, and I can say that they have helped me grow and learn a lot. You can read more about such opportunities by visiting the link on this slide. So this was it from my side and thank you so much for attending. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or drop a mail. You can find the links to these slides at arsharma.com slash talks. Once again, thank you so much for attending and I hope you learned something new out of this session. Thanks to Microsoft Azure and Equinix Metal for supporting us at the champion level. We also want to thank Red Hat and Slim.ai for funding us at our supporter level.